one. Today I'll be talking about scaphalunate interosseous ligament injuries. Uh, this is my overview here. So we'll be talking about uh, a number of things, but specifically at the end I'll be mentioning uh, scaphalunate interval or interosseous ligament injuries in distal radius fractures. Uh, this is a picture of Terry Thomas, who the gap is named after for the Terry Thomas sign, the gap between the scaphoid and the lunate. So in terms of anatomy, uh, the scaphalunate ligament is uh, th comprised of three components. The dorsal component is, provides the majority of the tensile strength, um, and it has the greatest constraint to translation between the scaphoid and the lunate. The volar component is half as thick as the dorsal band and contains the neurovascular bundles. And then the proximal component is a very thin uh, component which uh, is mainly fibro cartilage and blends with the articular cartilage. The, um, the, the scaphoid ligament actually merges with the radioscaphoid, uh, or radioscaphoid lunate ligament and is supplied by terminal branches of the AIN. And it has a high concentration of mechanoreceptors, uh, which is important for proprioception and hence dynamic stability, similar to those found in the ACL. This is a picture uh, just uh, showing the, the thick dorsal ligament at the top there and then uh, joined by the proximal uh, fibres to the volar component which is quite thin. In terms of the kinematics and the pathophysiology, um, the proximal carpal row is seen as an intercalated segment which means it has no muscular tendinous attachments and the movement is dictated by the surrounding bony and ligamentous interactions. So the lunate is finely balanced um, by its intercarpal attachments and specifically the scaphal lunate ligament and the lunotraquetral ligaments. The shape of the STT joint provides a flexion moment on the scaphoid while the shape of the triquetral hamate joint provides an extension moment on the triquetrum. And this creates like a balanced tension on the lunate through the, S, the, the scaphal lunate and lunotraquetral ligaments. Uh, when there's disruption of one of these ligaments, the balance is lost and the lunate is dominated by the remaining intercarpal relationship due to its function as the intercalated segment. So when, this, when you lose the scaphalunate ligament, you get abnormal posturing and movement of the scaphoid, which can lead to pain, disability and degeneration. So in pictorial representation, um, due to the, uh, these are the ligaments here, so you've got the scaphoid lunate and triquetrum combined or con joined by the scaphoid lunate ligament and then the lunar triquetral ligament. So when you go into radial deviation or you actually load the hand and wrist, due to the strong ligamentous attachments, the lunate tends to follow the scaphoid as it moves. And when this happens, the proximal carpal row tends to flex as a unit. When you go into ulnar deviation, um, the proximal carpal row tends to move from a flexed to an extended position. When the scaphoid ligament is ruptured, the balance forces acting in the lunate are lost and the scaphoid flexes while the lunate extends due to its intercarpal connection with the triquetrum, as mentioned before, via the lunotriquetral ligament. So this is more pronounced when the wrist is loaded as well. And this can lead to a dizzy or a dorsal intercalated segment instability. And this is often recognised as scaphoid flexion and lunate extension with an increased scaphoid angle greater than 70 degrees on the lateral wrist x-ray. And as the scaphoid flexes into or goes, falls into flexion, this can lead to scaphoid advanced collapse or also called a slack wrist and progressive radioscaphoid and capita lunate osteoarthritis. In terms of the epidemiology, uh, scaphoid ligament injuries are often associated with distal radius fractures and scaphoid fractures, specifically intra-articular fractures, so those such as the radial styloid fracture, like a shuffler fracture. There's a number of studies which have looked at the incidence in distal radius fractures, and there's a wide range from 7 to 64%, but the most studies state a, roughly a 40 to 60% incidence of scaphalunate injuries, all the way from partial tears to complete full thickness tears with uh, static and dynamic instability. If the x-ray shows a positive or a vo uh, ulnar variance greater than two millimeters at the time of this intra-articular fracture, uh, it's been shown to be associated with four times the risk of a, uh, an increased risk of a torn scaphalunate ligament with dynamic instability as shown on arthroscopy. Besides traumatic injuries, the scaphalunate uh, can tear in a degenerative fashion and this can be found in approximately 50% of patients over 80 years and it's more prevalent in rheumatoid arthritis, gout and pseudogout. Uh, 
uh, you're more likely to see volar or proximal tears rather than dorsal tears and just because of the, the weakened or the, the thinner ligaments on that side of the wrist. In terms of the mechanism of injury, this is commonly seen as a fall into a hypothena eminence with the wrist locked in extension, ulnar deviation and mid-carpal supination, similar to the left hand position of this lady falling in the picture. This locks the carpal bones together and the hamate is driven into the, uh, towards the lunate through the locked scaphoid and capitate. And the capitate then is forced between the scaphoid lunate interval and leads to the tearing of the ligament. In terms of the presentation and the examination, uh, most patients will present with dorsoradial wrist pain and directly over the, the scaphoid interval posteriorly or dorsally on the wrist. Uh, they have pain with loading, such as pushing up from a chair, uh, and will often describe catching, clicking, and clunking um, type symptoms in the wrist and weakness in their grip strength especially, and instability type symptoms. And when the wrist is put into a position of extension radial deviation, that will often cause pain uh, as it pushes the scape forward or flexes the scape forward further, uh, or pushes the scape forward further towards the, um, the radius. And then with the special test, the Watson test, which I'll show you shortly, is sometimes positive. However, it can have false positives in normal individuals just due to hyper -lig or ligamentous laxity. So this is the Watson test. In ulnar deviation, I'm going to hold the scaphoid in line and radially deviate the wrist, and it won't go. The proximal pole just rode right up onto the back of the radius, and you can see it drop back into its fossa. So in here, the radial deviation causes the scaphoid to flex, and the pressure over the thumb opposes this. But if there is instability due to a scaphoid lunate ligament tear, the scaphoid can dorsally sublux onto the dorsal rim of the radius as the proximal pole escapes from under the capitate. And so when you release the pressure over the scaphoid, it clunks back into its fossa, causing pain. In terms of diagnosis, this is this begins with standard uh, AP and lateral radiographs, but can also be done in radial and ulnar deviation and flexion extension views. And you can also do clenched fist PA views uh, to assess for dynamic instability. If a scaphoid lunate interval greater than three millimeters is noted on the clenched fist view, then it's said that the patient has dynamic instability of their scaphoid lunate interval. Uh, another sign you can see on the plain film x-ray is a cortical ring sign, which I'll show you on the next page, and shortening of the scaphoid. Uh, it's not that the scaphoid is physically shortened, but it appears to be shortened on the x-ray because of the flexion posturing. The scaphoid lunate angle can be increased on the lateral image. The range is normally between 40 to 60 degrees, so anything over sort of 65 to 70 is considered atypical or abnormal. Uh, and this has a, a high specificity. And so you can, if the scaphoid lunate angle is normal, you can confidently say that they don't have a dizzy. And it's important to get bilateral comparison views. Uh, it's been shown that in patients that have symptomatic scaphoid lunate dissociation on, with abnormal x-ray findings on one side, uh, up to 52% of them had abnormal x-ray findings on the contralateral side, which was asymptomatic. So it is important to check because if they do have widening on both sides, it may be that it uh, their pain could be driven by another pathology and it was just a, a, um, a finding that was there pre-injury. So this is an x-ray showing uh, a dizzy. So on the left hand side in the bottom in that circle you can see the, the cortical ring sign where there's increased cortical bone appearing on the x-ray because the scaphoid is flexed and the scaphoid appears shortened. And on the right side and there's an increased scaphoid lunate angle. So the green line represents the long axis of the scaphoid and the red line uh, represents a, well there's the, one of the lines is perpendicular to the distal most uh, join between the anterior and posterior aspects of the lunate, which is representing its long axis. In terms of diagnosis, um, you can use MRI and then also uh, MR arthrography. The uh, strength of the MRI scanner is directly proportional to the sensitivity of the scan. So where possible, these patients um, to diagnose these conditions <coughs> should be going into a three Tesla MRI if possible. Uh, the other thing that can increase sensitivity is um, adding arthrography. So even with a, a lower Tesla MRI, if you add uh, contrast injection to the rate of a carpal joint, the sensitivity increases and approaches 100%. And it also improves the detection of partial tears, which is often hard to do on standard MRI. Uh, 
And then you can diagnose other tears such as triangular fibrocartilage complex and lunotrochetral tears, as well as cartilage injuries, which are important because it allows for uh, guiding treatment. Multi-detector -de uh, CT arthrography is uh, quite sensitive for full tears uh, and also for partial tears. Unfortunately, at uh, Western Health, we don't have a multi-detector CT. Uh, however, we do have the capability to, to do arthrography. So I had a chat with the radiographers yesterday and they said that you can organise for MR arthrography for these types of patients. And it should take a similar amount of time as it would to get a normal MRI. And there's been some research into dynamic 4D CT or dynamic imaging, so real-time CT, which has got uh, showing promising um, results and will probably be uh, more frequently used as time continues. The gold standard or the benchmark for diagnosis is arthroscopy. Uh, this allows for definitive diagnosis of multiple pathologies, especially partial tears, and it allows you to grade the injury. Uh, so you yeah, get partial versus full thickness and whether it's stable or unstable. And it also shows you whether there's cartilage injuries, which um, would again guide treatment. The picture up the top is uh, an image showing a probe being driven between the scaphoid and lunate. And there is a specific uh, classification system based on arthroscopy that I haven't included here as it's quite specialised, um, which uh, goes through different stages based on whether it's a partial tear or whether it's a full thickness tear that allows for a probe to be pushed through or turned to allow for that 5 mil gap uh, or even to be able to drive the 2.7 scope through. And arthroscopy is useful for everyone except if there's a clear x-ray diagnosis uh, or chronic chronic tears with an advanced slack risk where the treatment um, algorithm is already determined. In terms of the types of SL tears, uh, the most common is an avulsion off the scaphoid side and mid-substance ruptures are actually relatively uncommon and hence the avulsion um, type injuries are actually um, much more likely to heal and so are more su suitable for an acute transosseous or suture ankle repair. I'll talk about that a bit later. The natural history of these injuries is relatively poorly understood because the majority of the injuries are thought to go undetected. And classically, it was thought that all of these tears progressed to a slack wrist. However, some research that came out in 2003 showed that uh, for a group of individuals that were followed up, this is only 11 patients. Um, all these articles have got small, small um, cohorts, but that these 11 patients with um, arthroscopic uh, diagnosed full thickness tears, only five to 10% of them progress to a slack wrist with a dizzy by seven years post uh, initial diagnosis. And they concluded that it probably depends on the activity level of the patient. Those that are more active are more likely to um, go into having a slack wrist. But they did also um, say that the majority of patients that had these tears did have some level of pain and dysfunction. In fact, all of them did have pain and dysfunction, and some of them were unable to return to their work uh, that they were doing pre-injury, uh, even despite not having arthritis. And, and then, as I mentioned before, bilateral radiographic scaphalunate dissociation can be asymptomatic on either one or both sides, and it's thought to be due more to degenerative tears or atraumatic causes. Uh, and it could also be related to, or they postulated from ligamentous laxity or extreme ligamentous laxity. This is uh, some pictures out of the first natural history study of scaphalunate ligament injuries, which was published by Kirk Watson, who was in that video before, back in 1997. He likened the scaphoid's proximal articular surface to a teaspoon. So with flexion and extension of the scaphoid, this normally occurs with full articular contact in an elliptical fossa, as seen in the left-hand side when it's aligned. However, if you have abnormal posturing and motion of the scaphoid due to the loss of the ligamentous stability, this leads to increased radioscaphoid joint forces and point loading on either side of the radius. And that's thought to lead to, lead to the, the degenerative change. Um, with this, you get subsequent capital lunate shear loading, and that's where the slack wrist comes. Um, in terms of the radiolunate joint, that's relatively spared in terms of this disease progression because it has a very forgiving spherical shape to its articulation, and this is generally why four corner fusion operations is successful. This is an image showing uh, the natural history of a scaphalunate interosseous ligament injury with static instability over a period of five years. 
Uh, so the image on the right shows a significant radio scaphoid arthritic change. In terms of the classification system, uh, this is a staging of severity that was uh, described by Garcia Elias. It is a little bit um, detailed, but it is very important because it does guide treatment quite well. So the stages from one to six, where one is a partial scaphoid uh, ligament injury with the dorsal, with that, that really thick, strong dorsal band still intact. Number two is a complete dorsal band injury, but it's repairable, such as those avulsion injuries. Stages, uh, stage three is a non-repairable ligament injury, so more chronic injuries or uh, mid-substance ruptures, but they're normally aligned scaphoid. Uh, it's difficult, stages one to three, because they have normal alignment on the radiographs, they're generally only diagnosed with more advanced imaging or arthroscopy. Stage four is a complete and non-repairable scaphalinate ligament injury, but it has reducible malalignment. So that might be um, positive dynamic stress testing. Uh, but then five is where there's irreducible malalignment. So that's uh, in patients that have had um, a chronic injury where they've got a lot of fibrosis. And so that the scaphoid is flexed and the scaphalinate interval is widened and that doesn't reduce. But these patients have normal cartilage. So that's as described on um, a MRI or arthroscopy. And then six is like uh, at the end, end stage where a patient's essentially um, developing a slack risk with cartilage degeneration. In terms of the treatment, uh, it is quite controversial. Um, there's no really solid articles or studies that say that long-term function with surgery is improved or that arthritis is prevented. There are a number of smaller sort of case series and retrospective reviews of patients, sort of less than 30 patients. Um, and so the treatment is determined mainly by expert opinion and individual experience. I've put this treatment algorithm in as it shows the complexity of determining treatment based on the different stages of injury and just specifically with regards to looking at acute versus chronic injuries, the authors have stated that if they're picked up and operated within a period of sort of two to three weeks after the injury, and then that can be considered as an acute injury and would be more suitable for repairs as opposed to requiring reconstructions. So I'm going to speak very briefly on each of the different stages and what the suggested treatment is. So for stage ones where there's partial tears, it is controversial. Some would recommend immobilization, rest and then hand therapy with a program that's targeted on proprioceptive rehabilitation of the FCR tendon, which is an important dynamic stabilizer. And others would suggest surgical management with arthroscopic debridement. As it's been shown to have benefit in partial tears because they think that the pain is due to a secondary mechanical impingement from the tear flap actually getting caught. Uh, you can do temporary KY fixation to augment this and there's other techniques described such as capsular shrinking or dorsal capsulodesis if it's a more chronic injury. However, uh, these are both shown to reduce range of motion significantly. So a capsulodesis is predicted to cause at least a 15 degree loss of wrist flexion. In stage two, um, this is where there's repairable tear, and so these are the ones where uh, transosseous repair or suture anchor repair of the scaphalinate uh, ligament back to the bone that it's come off is uh, thought to be successful. Moving on to stage three and four, uh, so for non-repairable tears, there's been previous um, techniques described such as bone soft tissue bone autographs, so uh, some surgeons have previously used a bone retinaculum bone graft from the dorsal distal radius. However, the research is coming out that tendon reconstruction or tenodesis with KY augmentation seems to have better outcomes for these patients. And I'll talk about some of the types of operations shortly. For stage four, uh, where it's there's reducible subluxation, this is similar to, re it requires reconstruction uh, via a tendon uh, transfer or tenod uh, tenodesis with KY augmentation. Uh, and it's generally required on arthroscopy to determine if it is reducible subluxation. These are some of the most common tenodesis procedures. So on the left hand side, the Brunelli, which is an FCR tendon slip that's threaded through a tunnel in the distal scaphoid and then fixed to the dorsal distal radius. And this was later modified to avoid crossing the radiocarpal joint and instead attaching the FCR back onto itself or to the lunate directly, uh, which is aimed to reduce the loss of range of motion.
The van der Bell is uh, modified by passing the FCR under the radio triquetral ligament and then tensioned or sewn onto itself. And then the Garcia Elias, uh, they pioneered the tri-ligament tenodesis, or a 3LT they called it, uh, where they attached the FCR to a trough in the lunate and with some suture anchors and then passed it through the dorsal radiocarpal ligament and then secured it back onto itself. So it's intended to reconstruct the STT, the dorsal scaphalunate and the dorsal radiotrochetral ligaments. And they're reporting over a 70% success rate uh, in terms of achieving a painless, highly functional wrist at four years post-op. This is the modified Brunelli uh, tenodesis, as I mentioned before. Um, and you can see on the right hand side the, how the dorsal pull of the FCR slip uh, reduces the rotatory subluxation and the widen it can also reduce the widening of the scaphalunate interval. Scaphalunate screws have also been used to create a stable fibrous non-union between the two bones and this procedure is known as the razzle or the reduction and associated uh, association of the scaphoid and lunate and it's demonstrated good long-term results. Uh, however, there have been a number of reports of screw breakage and osteolysis requiring metal wear removal. And you can also use the screws instead of K <coughs> excuse me, instead of KYs to immobilize the soft tissue reconstructions that you've done. Stages five and six are moving more towards salvage procedures. So stage five, where there's um, irreducible subluxation, they recommend aggressive soft tissue release to convert it from an irreducible subluxation to a reducible subluxation, and then you can attempt tenon reconstruction. But a lot of surgeons just move straight to a salvage procedure as is listed in the stage six, where there are any number of things that can be done when there's cartilage loss. So minor things from neurectomies and radial stylodectomies all the way to uh, total wrist fusions and total wrist arthroplasty. This is a, um, a modification of that staging system that was initially posed, uh, or another one initially posed by uh, Kirk Watson. I find this is a bit more of a simple staging system as each of the stage can be clearly delineated by the radiographs alone. So stage one being pre-dynamic you know, instability, so partial tears, and then you've got dynamic instability where you've got stress testing positive on the x-rays and then static instability uh, where you have um, widening the scaphalunate interval but no dizzy and stage four is where you've got a dizzy where that scaphalunate angle is increased and then stage five is the slack wrist that's just another way to classify things moving on to the final thing which is scaphalunate interval or interosseous ligament injuries in distal radius fractures so Intra-articular fractures have been shown to have two times the risk, and that's specifically the Schofield fractures, um, but also other intra-articular intra fractures are associated with an increased risk of scaphalunar dissociation. Um, it's been shown that a, appropriate immobilization does not reduce the scaphalunate gap or improve the scaphalunate angle. Uh, only surgery can do that. Um, unstable slill injuries are associated with more pain in, um, in, in patients, but there's an, this study by Ford showed that um, even with unstable slill injuries as diagnosed on arthroscopy, um, that was done at the time of fixation of the distal radius, those patients did have a greater amount of static and dynamic dissociation on the x-ray and higher pain. However, the function was exactly the same as patients that didn't have a, a scaphalunate interosseous ligament injury. And those that have a acute repair or a subacute chronic repair uh, versus those that have no repair at all, um, the outcomes are actually quite similar in the majority of studies. And there's another one by Dwithman. So there's some sort of thought that maybe scaphalunate injuries in distal radius fractures are relatively well tolerated and so they don't need to be uh, addressed intraoperatively. And then another final um, article by uh, Swart and Tang that showed no difference at one year between those that had distal radius fracture with and without scaphalunate injuries in 42 patients. But as you can imagine, these are all relatively small studies. And this uh, article is, uh, oh, sorry, that's um, the same one by Dwethman, I've just copy pasted. Uh, but the, um, there's some pictures there of uh, types of fractures, so the Schofield fracture with that scaphalunate static instability. And then also on the left hand side, a extra articular disarratus fracture that has a clear scaphalunate interval gap. And then two more studies just uh, to finish off with. 
The first study had a 38 patients, again, small study, but they, it was more of a natural history study, so looking at the outcomes after 13 to 15 years post an untreated partial or complete scaphalinate injury uh, associated with a disradius fracture. And they found that uh, the subjective and objective and radiographic outcomes were similar to those that had either no tear or in the patients that did have a tear, it was similar to the contralateral side that was asymptomatic. And there was a slight reduction in grip strength for the patients that had a complete tear. However, this wasn't um, statistically significant and the, the VAS outcomes were the same and, and no patients progressed to a slack wrist in this study. And the final study uh, by Lance et al. Uh, it was again a small study with CT proven scaphoid, scaphoid dissociation after distal radius fracture. It was quite an interesting study. This is a, a they did contralateral CT and they actually showed that eight out of the 14 patients that had the proven uh, ipsilateral dissociation had it also bilaterally. And at two years, 13 out of those 14 patients had a normal Q dash score, so no disability. Uh, and there was one patient that had a poor Q dash score, but they had already had, or they already had pre-existing wrist osteoarthritis. So in summary, scaphalunate interosseous ligament injuries, they're quite common and associated with many intraarticular radius fractures. The isolated ligament injuries, either with static or dynamic instability, are thought to do better when treated operatively if you're wishing to achieve a painless stable wrist. However, the scaphalunate injuries that are associated with distal radius fractures from the available evidence, which is quite uh, weak, seem to be well tolerated. Uh, and so I think more research needs to be done in this area. However, a lot of these studies don't assess really unstable ligament injuries. Um, so it's, it's hard to sort of read into the outcomes. Uh, and the most successful operations are thought to be tenodesis operations, um, whereby the slip of FCR is commonly used to stabilise the scaphalunate interval. Thanks very much.